Hey, good day, it's Presso. Thanks for stopping by. Now, this is episode two of building a diesel fuel burner for my home foundry furnace. Now, I've put together a playlist and it includes the build of the furnace itself and also episode one of building the diesel burner. And the link for that is up above there now. Now, since the last video, I've done some extra work on the furnace and also an accessory that goes with that and I'll show you those details in a minute. But today's video is more about trying to connect the fuel pump to the diesel burner nozzle. Now a lot of people have told me that the fuel pump that I have is probably unsuitable and I'm starting to think that's true. But I want to connect it up and try it just the same. If it's no good, uh, we can move forward and try a different style of pump. But uh, let me just bring you in close now look at some of the work that I've done since the last video. First little improvement I've made to the foundry furnace here is a way of moving the lid when you want to gain access to the interior of the furnace. Now when I built this furnace I included this little foot pedal here, this yellow pedal. And when you press down on that it lifts the furnace lid clear of the furnace body and you can move the lid one way or the other. Now that works great, the only problem is that you've got to get your hand down close to the exit uh, of the furnace interior through this hole here or when you push it to one side you're exposing the incandescent refractory on the inside of the furnace and even with gloves on that's dangerous. So ideally what you want to do is be able to manipulate the lid with your hand well clear of this area, the interior of the furnace or the exit from the lid. And a gentleman I know in New Zealand named John Pierce, uh, he's got a YouTube channel called the Hobby Machinist NZ. He made a similar style of furnace to this one, but he had the foresight to include a handle on the lid, which you can move one way or the other and not have your hand anywhere near those hot parts uh, on the interior of the furnace. So I've adopted the same idea. Just a piece of steel rod welded to this brace here, and I've got two heavy valve springs here. They are off some sort of a, an engine. I've tack welded those two springs together in the center, and then they're welded to the steel bar which forms the right angle handle. And the idea here is that the coil spring uh, loses its heat very quickly uh, or doesn't actually conduct a lot of heat through from the handle itself. So it stays relatively cool, but you should still be using a glove. And now you can see that I can move that lid accurately and easily and safely. So that's a bonus. <laughs> In the last video, I said I was gonna cut off this socket so that I can use my diesel burner through where the propane burner used to go. And this is where the propane burner would fit. But as you can see here, what I've done is I've rotated the whole furnace body around so I can fit the diesel furnace in to the same hole where the propane burner used to go. And it's very easy. There's just two M8 hex headed bolts at the top. And if you undo those bolts, you can rotate the furnace body around. So what I can do now is if I do want to use the propane burner, I undo this hex head bolt here, rotate the furnace body around so that the inlet is in line with this burner. And I can use this one or I can rotate the other way and use the diesel burner. So it just gives me another option for firing the furnace. And uh, although this propane burner works well, I think it's probably underpowered for a furnace of this size, but it does work. So there you go, I've got an option. The other thing I've done since the last video is I've made up this service cart for my fuel tank and also for the electric blower. Now, one of the things I want to be able to do here is be able to move all of these items outside when I'm using the furnace. So the furnace itself and the service cart can just get wheeled out and when I'm finished with them, I can put them away and store them away separately. Now this is just made from some welded uh, 25 millimeter square hollow section tube steel and uh, the base and the the back are made from this six millimeter aluminium tread plate. I had a bigger sheet of this I had to cut it up to make three parts and I used my plasma cutter to do that and typically uh, the first two cuts were a bit ordinary uh, they didn't cut through very cleanly but by the time I got to the third one I had the settings all dialed in just went perfectly the waste piece just fell off, no trouble at all. And it's always the way, you've got these tools, you don't use them very often, it does take a while to get back into the groove uh, with those processes. 
But I had a friend, Tig Weld, this together for me because that's not something I do very well, but he's very good at, at it. And uh, what I can do now is uh, just yeah, wheel this around and I want to be able to fit a console which contains all of the switches and all of the electronics to control the speed of the blower and possibly the pump capacity. So this is big enough, it's just some aluminium square tube and I 3D printed some end plates for that and I can fit all my switches and dials and everything on that top surface there and that'll either go in front of the handle or at the back, I'm not quite sure yet but what I need to do now is to make a handle that fits into the socket here and it'll be the same size and shape as the handle on my uh, furnace and it's made from some 25mm ERW steel tubing and I'm going to bend that in the Hossfeld bender, so we're going to do that in a minute. The other thing I've done here is I've fitted this tube to the end of my burner body. And this was just tack welded in place with four welds. And it's got a gap, an annular gap, uh, that allows cooling air to pass through. And that's going to allow me to use a hose clamp onto my plastic tube here. And hopefully that will stop this plastic tube from melting. Now if that doesn't work, I'll go and buy some of that uh, blue silicon tube from the auto accessory shop. They use it for connecting up turbochargers in cars. It's um, more heat uh, resistant than this stuff here, but we'll see what happens. I'm not sure if it's going to be necessary, but that's an option. Okay, let's go and bend up this bit of tube now. This is my shop made version of the Hossfeldt bender, and it's a very, very versatile tool. There are drawings available on the internet for building this tool. Uh, the only problem is that they're all in inches and I need to be able to convert it to metric to suit metric flat bar and round stock. So I did that and made the bender. I actually made two, I made one for a friend. And they work great. The only problem is that you've got to be able to get the tooling uh, to make it versatile. And getting original Hossfeldt tooling here in Australia is just about impossible. And it's very expensive even if you can find it. So you also need to be able to make all of the other tools to go with it. Um, and you know, that's a lot of turning of big diameter steel stock. And the tool that I made for bending this ERW tubing is cast in aluminium. So I made a pattern, I cast that myself, I machined out the half round profile there on the lathe using a radius turning tool. And it bends this thin walled ERW tubing very easily. So that's what I'm going to use and uh, I've got a position here marked on my stock. That's where the beginning of the bend should be. And I've made up this little uh, steel plug to go in the end. Now this will actually connect the round tube to the square tube in the service cart. But it's also going to stop that uh, material from collapsing when it's pushed against the stop block. So I'll get all this set up and we'll make the bend. And I've got a template over here I can use to check the, the radius of the bend and the angle of the bend so it matches the handle that I've got on the foundry furnace. Okay, let's get set up. Just looking over the back of the bender here at the moment, you can see my mark there on the steel tube. It's aligned with the tangent point on the bending die itself. And I've got this big square steel block here to prevent the tube from moving when we swing the moving frame around. So there's the bending die itself and there's a steel pin through here through one of these holes to prevent the die block from moving. And we've got this big V-roller, that's what's going to guide the tube around as we make the bend. And I've got that piece of steel, this is going to be the transition between the steel tube and the square on the back of the service cart. And that's going to prevent that steel tube from collapsing when we make the bend. So I'll put the camera back on the tripod and we'll do the bend and we'll check the angle and the radius. Although you can't see it in the shot, I've got a great big steel tube on the end of the swinging frame here. That's going to give me the leverage that I need to make this bend. So let's try that. Now there's my plywood template <laughs> and we're a long way off but if you over bend it it's really hard to bring it back again. 
So we're just going to go in small increments here and try and get this to match the other hand that I've already got. Okay, we're pretty close. Now there is a large circular frame that can be fitted underneath the Hosfeld bender with a series of stops on it. And if you needed to make like 10 of these, you can set the stop and bring the handle, the swinging frame around uh, to the same stop every time and reproduce that bend exactly. But if you're just doing a one-off, it's just a case of trial and error. Anyway, uh, I'll take this plug out. Now it actually needs to go on the other end of the handle and we'll fit it and see how it looks. Just hammered that steel adapter plug into the top of the square tube there now. And our piece of round tube stock can go over that. And yes, I know you can bend square steel tube in a Hosfeld bender, but uh, I don't have the die for doing that. You need to make a special die that puts a ridge on the inside of the bend. And in that uh, thickness of tube, um, I don't think I'm strong enough to bend that. <laughs> but it does bend this round stuff very well. So I'll get that tap down, we'll get a weld on that, and then I can move this whole assembly around the shop very easily. So let's have a look at it compared to the foundry furnace itself. Well, there's the foundry furnace and the service cart back to back now, and the OCD part of my brain needed to have these two handles, the same height, same radius, same angle, same material, and they'll eventually be the same color. But uh, it's now given me the option to move this around quickly and easily, and it looks nice. While I've got the Hosfeld bender set up, we need to get the second bend put in this fuel delivery tube here. And I've got a couple of bending dies made up for doing that. And then we can do a trial fit and see how this is going to assemble inside the burner tube itself. So let's do that. What you are looking at here is a 2D mock-up of my burner assembly. And this front half is going to be more or less mounted in the furnace permanently. And this back section here is going to be removable. And the two halves fit together like that with that coupling in the center. So what I need to do is to arrange the fuel delivery line to enter through the side of this section here and extend forward into the permanently mounted section of the tube. And that's what I've drawn here in my 2D mock-up. So here's the front half of the burner that's fitted into the furnace. Here's the back half that's removable. And I've got the fuel assembly fitted there so far. Um, what I need to do is put a bend back here and bring this back section of the fuel delivery tube parallel to the removable section of the burner. Now at the front here, I've drawn in the 60 degree spray pattern that this uh, burner nozzle can produce. And sort of what you want is you want to have that spray pattern fill the end of the burner tube. If it touches the edges of the tube, it will sort of condense into a liquid and dribble down the inside of the furnace and make a mess. And I want to be able to have a range of adjustment there. So I want to bring the tip of the burner either forward or back from that point by about 25 millimeters or an inch. And I've worked out a way of doing that. It's going to mean slotting the edge of this uh, pipe here. But uh, I, I, I'll do that later. I'll address that later. What I need to do now is to get this extra bend in this piece of stainless steel tube here. And I've marked the tangent point. I uh, sort of see that there. And the bend will need to start from that point and extend out. Now I've got some uh, aluminium bending dies in the Hosfeld bender. And we're going to give that a try now and see if it works. And we want to get a nice smooth bend there without any kinks. So uh, yeah, wish me luck. <laughs> Okay, this is the rig that I got set up in the Hosfeld bender. So these two aluminium dies here have got a half round profile machine in the outer edge. And that's the same diameter as the outside diameter of our stainless steel tube. I've got the tangent point sitting here and it's against a mark that I've clocked on the edge of the fixed die. So this die doesn't move. This is the moving die and it's attached to the moving arm of the Hosfeld bender. When we pull that arm around, it's going to drag the tube around the fixed die and give us the bend, I hope. Now back here, I've got a steel stop block and I put a five millimeter drill bit inside the tube there. 
just to prevent the tube from collapsing because that's going to be the fixed point and the tube will want to sort of move around, push into that steel block there. Now, this arrangement's not ideal. Uh, what you should have is the two bending dies more or less touching each other. So they completely enclose the tube at the point where it bends. I think it's going to be okay. Uh, we're just going to try it out. If this doesn't work, we get a kink in it. I'll have to make this tube out of some thick walled steel brake line. But uh, let's give it a go. All right, so far so good. Seems to be okay. And I might have just fluked that. I think that's parallel. <laughs> Let's put it back on the drawing and see how it looks. Well, there it is. Now, it wasn't uh, okay. I'll take it back, put it in the machine and just give it a few more degrees of bend to bring it parallel to the back section of the burner tube here. And it did kink just very, very slightly. It's sort of tiny bit swollen across that dimension there. But, you know, if you stand back a bit, you won't see it. <laughs> and it's going to carry fuel, so that's fine. And what I need to do next is to get this brass fitting silver soldered to this end of the tube here. That will allow us to connect the, the burner nozzle and at the other end we're going to silver solder that fitting there and that's going to allow me to hook up my pump through the flexible fuel line and actually pressurize the nozzle and see whether it does the right thing. So uh, let's do that, let's get the soldering done and we can test it. I'll just uh, polish the end of the stainless steel tube and these brass fittings are fairly loose fit on there because we want the silver solder to wick into the joint. Now there's a chance that one of these will have to come off again later on, but today I just want to hook it all up and just see if the pump is going to do its job. So I'll get these silver soldered and I'm just going to use a small propane torch to do this with. I don't want to overheat this. Sort of got to be careful here, you don't get too much flux on the brass fitting because the silver solder will flow up onto that surface there and stop the union nut from engaging on the back of the cone. So you've got to have plenty on the tube that goes inside the brass fitting, but don't get too messy with it on the outside of the brass fitting. That's really awkward to do when you got shaky hands, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, but I think that one's come out okay. Uh, one of the other ends not quite so neat, but uh, I think it'll do. Let's get it hooked up now. Okay, as you can see here, I've got all the plumbing completed. Uh, everything's tight as far as I can get it. I've got the fuel pump in the bottom of this 10 litre plastic tank here, and I've got about three litres of diesel in the bottom of the tank. Now I've got a variable power supply here, DC power supply. I've set the volts to 12 volts. I've set the amps to about 2 amps. And we're about to run the pump. And uh, let's just see if we can get a spray pattern from the nozzle. Okay, here we go. Alright, well we got a nice fine spray. Looks like it's atomizing the fuel quite well. But will it light? <laughs> So uh, hold on to your hats, let's give this a try. Wow, that's intense. 
And it's surprising the amount of heat that's coming off that, like just radiant heat. Um, but you'll notice it's not burning right back against the nozzle. So the flame front uh, is burning out probably about six inches, 150 millimeters from the tip of the nozzle. Now, all of that may change when we get this confined inside the burner tube and we get a supply of auxiliary air going through that tube. But for the moment, that looks encouraging. Now, my only issue is that we may be maxing out the fuel pump and that's as much fuel as, as it's ever going to pump. And uh, I guess that uh, the next step would be to go to a, a higher capacity pump. But for the moment, I'm going to run with that. Uh, a lot of people suggested that that pump was no good and uh, maybe it's going to change when we get it inside the furnace. I have got a fuel leak coming from this valve here, so I need to address that as well. So what I'll do now is I'm going to get all of this hooked up inside the burner tube and uh, we'll give it a try with the blower as well and then we can make a decision about fuel pump. But yeah, that's... Um, <laughs> That was surprising, the amount of heat that was coming off that. Let's try it again. Yeah, I think that's going to work. Now that I know the spray nozzle works, I've got to work out a way of coupling these two halves of the burner tube together. And this coupling ring is going to be welded to the section that fits into the furnace. And then we need to be able to have some sort of a locking screw here so that the back section can be removed. And I'm going to cut a slot in here and use one of these M6 ratchet handles to lock those two halves together. So I'll go ahead and do that. And then I can weld this coupling ring onto this section and then we've got to figure out a way of getting the fuel delivery line through the side of this section of the tube and making it adjustable. But I have a plan for that. <laughs> Well that's going to allow our ratchet handle to fit through that slot there. It'll be threaded into the burner tube and it'll pull up tight when we lock the handle. Okay, that was a dumb thing to do. I have to throw that out of there now. Well, there's the burner assembly to this point, and uh, don't be judging my welds. <laughs> I don't care what they look like as long as they hold. 
And what will happen here is this section of the burner will be fitted more or less permanently into the furnace body itself and the rear section which will have the blower attached and the fuel delivery line can be removed. So all we need to do is unlock that handle, bring it apart, put it back together again and we can lock it. And that means I can put this part away, it's not going to be protruding out the side of the furnace while it's in storage. Now, the next thing I have to do is work out a way of fitting the fuel delivery line through the side of the burner body. Now, a lot of people have given me really good advice on this and a lot of the approaches are sound and simple, but what I tend to do is overcomplicate things. And I want to be able to move the fuel delivery line fore and aft inside the burner itself by about an inch. And that means putting a long slot in the side of the body here. Now I can cover that up with a cover plate and it'll have a way of actually locking it in place. So we're sealing off the outside of the burner and uh, I think that's going to work. It's going to give me a little bit more adjustment, especially given that this is an experimental design. So I'm going to put the slot in, we'll get the fuel delivery line through and that might be the end of today's video. Well here's the setup. Uh, I've got to cut a 25mm long slot with a 20mm slot drill. I'm running this at 450 RPM and I've got three points of contact, V block on this side up against the fixture of the bias on the other side. I've just eyeballed the position of that 6mm thread. Uh, it's close enough to what we're doing. Now I must say I've never used a slot drill this big in a piece of round pipe. <laughs> so uh, anything could happen. Should be exciting. So let's, let's give it a try. This is a set of cunning slot drill, so I think we'll be okay. Well, that wasn't so scary after all. Uh, good old Bridgeport. <laughs> okay, let's put the fuel delivery line in there and see what it looks like, and then I think we'll wrap up. Well, this is what it looks like to this point. So now I can put the burner nozzle through that hole and push it up into the fixed section that will be inside the furnace body itself. And what that allows me to do is to move the whole burner assembly or the, the actual nozzle assembly backwards and forwards. And in order to cover up that hole, I've 3D printed a mock-up of what that's going to look like. So this is printed in two parts, and it means I can take that section out there, slide it over the fuel tube, and put this back in again. But when I go to make this out of metal, uh, this will just have the angular hole through for the fuel tube. And it will need to be assembled and silver soldered in place. So the way it works at the moment, I can put that on from the back and slide it up onto the fuel tube and then put this little cover piece in place as well. But you have to imagine that later on I won't be able to do that. I'll need to remove the brass fitting at this end, slide that plate over and re-solder that brass fitting. But then I can slide that cover plate up and down and get the range of movement that I need. So this will need to have some slots in it and a couple of cap head screws to hold that down. It doesn't need to be absolutely airtight, it's just so that we don't waste any of the blower air coming out through that hole there. You can sort of see how that's going to work now. I can move the whole burner assembly in and out just to give me some positioning of the end of the burner tip. But the only problem is that that whole thing just flops around inside the end of the tube and there's nothing to constrain it. And what I've done just while I've been mocking things up is I made a, a wooden plug and that fits over the end of the burner nozzle. like so, and I can sort of keep that centred in the tube while I sort of play around with dimensions and so on. 
But clearly that's going to be no good for our finished burner. So what I've been doing is just uh, playing around with some prototypes for a nozzle guide vane or swirl plate, uh, whatever you like to call it. This one was made of aluminium and uh, I just uh, roughed it out uh, using just uh, hand tools. Uh, and I was twisting the veins there and it was all going fairly well but it's too soft and it started to distort in the center. So I abandoned this one. I'll make one out of stainless steel, some thin stainless steel sheet because that material is fairly heat resistant. And what will happen eventually is that will just slip over the end of the, the burner nozzle like that. Keep it centered in the tube, uh, but it also may help prevent turbulence at this end of the burner. So it's sort of direct the air in a sort of a spiral pattern. I checked with Perry Merritt. Uh, he had a go at doing this himself and he said it actually restricted his airflow too much, so he took it off. So um, I'm not sure whether uh, my blower is gonna handle this. Uh, we'll try it, uh, see how it goes. I guess what you could do is twist those veins almost parallel to the airflow so that they don't so much restrict it as just straighten it. But we'll try that out on a prototype. So I did actually draw this up in Corel Draw uh, just to get my dimensions right and uh, I'll do this one more accurately. I'll do it on the CNC mill to position all the holes and mark everything out and then we'll give that a go. So what I've got here is a PWM speed controller. This one's for 12 to 24 volts DC I think and this will allow me to control the speed of the fuel pump and what I'm hoping is that I can reduce the fuel flow for starting. Once we've got a stable flame we can start to ramp up the fuel feed and because I've got blower control as well, we can sort of fine tune the flame. Now to drive this speed controller, I've got a 240 volt to 12 volt power supply, and this will go inside that console that I showed you. And then we've got full speed control over the blower and the fuel pump. So uh, I think that's gonna be, you know, as much control as I need to get this to work in a stable way. Alrighty, now some people have told me that they're seeing a lot more advertising on my YouTube videos just recently. Now unfortunately there's nothing I can do about that. Now YouTube recently updated their terms and conditions and what they have done is they've reserved the right to insert advertising on any YouTube channel whether the creator has agreed to it or not. Now I didn't agree to it. Uh, I made a decision some time ago to remain completely independent. I don't want to be partnered with anybody. And that way I can just put the videos out there and you can either watch them or not. It's your decision. You know, it's, it's a bit annoying really that, you know, they're going to put those ads in there and they're going to get revenue. And I sort of get it. Uh, YouTube are providing a service and it's not free. It, does, it costs money. So they're trying to recoup some of that uh, from my channel. But I get nothing. So I don't have any partnership with YouTube. I, I don't monetize any of my videos. So I'm terribly sorry, but uh, you're just going to have to live with that. However, you can enable a certain extension on your Chrome browser, which uh, makes those ads go away. Uh, but I didn't tell you that, okay? <laughs> All right, so uh, I'm gonna invite you to come back next time. Uh, we're gonna see this burner, hopefully burning fuel inside the furnace, and I promise it's gonna be exciting. So please join me for that. And for now, Espresso, signing out. I'll see you next time.